And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple. The he the head and head ha and head honcho. Yes, those are two different things of Monarch Arts and creator of the upcoming Iron Frontier campaign setting for D and D fifth edition. The one and only Micah Brogan. How are you doing today, man? Or today? Um, yeah, I'm good. Uh, it is today over here, so so you're right on both counts, I guess. Oh. It's it's one of the, it's just one of those cases where time zones drive me insane. Oh, uh, trust me, I I am fully with you. Most of my audience is US based. I'm UK based. I don't like being awake until five AM to make sure that I get everything, get the uh the message out on t to the right people. I fully understand. Mm -hmm. Oh. Might be might be time to invest in some stronger coffee. Maybe, but well, uh, at the very least, at the very least, you're pro you're probably having nicer weather in the UK than what I've got. I mean, not that we're allowed to go outside at the moment, but uh, yeah, it hasn't been too bad actually. Oh, um, it's ju it's just that um. Every Everybody looks. Everybody looks at the kind of weather that I get, where it, where I'm lucky if I get, I'm lucky if I get into single positive digits, and and ask how I can, how I possibly live with it. Ah <laughs> uh, man, uh, growing up in Britain, uh, you get used to the cold very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's when it gets, uh, it's when it's starting to get really warm over here during the summer, and uh, me and the remainder of the public don't seem to know how to deal with that <laughs> so uh it's like no bring back the cold please we liked it when a hot day was like six degrees um well right n right now it's negative below on um fahrenheit and i would convert that to celsius but at that point does it really matter yeah um so it's a a bit of a tradition to open with the humble beginnings, as it were. So, walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games, and what was it that made it stick? Uh, it's a story I actually really like telling. Um, I When I was, uh, like, 11, so 17 years ago, <laughs> um, yeah, when I was about 11, uh, I was around a friend's house, and... Uh, they mentioned that their dad used to play like because we were playing uh we were we were in his attic which was like this converted computer space and there was like nine pcs there because his dad was a bit of a pc buff um and like his entire family were like proper gamers uh so we were playing diablo 2 i think at the time like a heavily modded version and uh he mentioned that his dad used to play Dungeons and Dragons and that he had like the first edition rules kicking around somewhere and uh, me and a, the few of my friends that were there were like, yeah, let's give it a go. Uh, so we came back the next week and uh, that friend of ours ran us through character creation and uh, ran us through a session. Uh, we all died at the end of the first session, <laughs> which was, you know, first edition shenanigans. I made a character he made a character who started with zero max health so uh you know first edition things um and then uh we were like okay maybe first edition is not the right way to go we, we tried it a couple more times it didn't really work uh and his dad came down with uh advanced dungeons and dragons and we were like what's this and he was like oh it's, this is second edition and we were like great so we gave that a go uh oh good the the beginning of things like Thaco, which was great fun. Uh, yeah, so we ended up like basically going through his dad's collection of all of the rule books for editions one through uh, four at that point. Mm -hmm. um, 
And yeah, I don't know. Just uh, it's it's as like a massive RPG buff in general. Uh, I liked the, I I liked the way that the game functioned. It it made sense to me because, I mean, most uh, like traditional RPG turn based combat things are uh, vaguely based off of D and D. You know, you've got your hidden numbers and your to hit stats and stuff like that. So it all just kind of made sense and. I just really, really enjoyed it. I, I like telling stories. Um, I've been an avid writer my entire life. Whether it's any good or not is another question. You know, I was only 11. But, you know, we were like, I was a massive fan of, uh, like, fantasy literature and stuff. And this gave a really good outlet for that. Uh, and it was only... I stuck with 3.5 edition for the longest time, for years and years and years. Um, I played the beta for 5th edition, didn't enjoy it particularly, uh, and then all the changes that they made between the early, early beta for 5th and what it is now, very much enjoy it now, like, can't get enough 5th edition as it is, um, hence the creating custom content on a bi-weekly basis. Alright. And I'm I'm guessing that's what led to the creation of the of the line Monarch, Monarch Arts. Yes, uh, basically, I had been uh, working with uh, another very small startup on uh, a a Kickstarter that was uh, fulfilled last year. So it was like a couple of years of like game design stuff that I'd been doing. And uh, I'd gone back to university as an adult to do a degree in games design um, and development. So, uh, you know, like I just, uh, it gave me an outlet for my, for like my passion of creating game content. And uh, basically I realized that I could probably just start my own business and like, I have ideas, I sell them. Like, why not just make a brand on it? And so I did, and uh, like I've been running the Monarch Arts Patreon for six months, and it is taking its sweet time to build up an audience. But it, that's it's one of those things, you know. Um, Rome wasn't but... built in a day. No, indeed. Uh, and so I've just been kind of uh, alongside that. I've been working on uh, Iron Frontier for the last two and a half years, uh, and like some other like smaller projects here and there um like assisting with uh other projects and doing some consultation work and mm -hmm. you know keeping myself busy for very little money <laughs> yeah. uh and yeah no the um so monarch arts kind of was me trying to seriously uh take it seriously like as a business mm -hmm. because it was in, it's important to me that like this is successful in some way like i don't need to become a millionaire off of it i just need to earn enough that i can pay my rent basically <laughs> i just want to make quality content for people basically now that does bring me to iron frontier that which is your take on doing a um, gothic western ap approach to fantasy now, first thing I did want to ask is what pro what prompted the idea for it? Because obviously, going from the typical um, high fantasy affairs to so to something oh, to something that's more akin to the old west is quite a leap. Um, basically, I was talking to uh, a friend of mine who's actually my community manager. And um, we, we'd been discussing for a little while about, like, projects that we'd want to work on after the project we were working on with this other company. And we were like, well, what sort of stuff would we want to make? And uh, basically, I was like, you know what? There's not enough steampunk in D&D, &D, and there can never be enough gothic themes in anything. Uh, as... <laughs> Again, as somebody who's uh, kind of been an avid reader for my entire life, I don't stray too far from fantasy and, and gothic literature, uh, which is probably bad, but oh, who cares? I enjoy it. It's good fun. Why, um, why are you saying that's bad? Ah, you know, having a breadth of 
you know, oh, like, oh, is that way you can write better crime thrillers and stuff and make content that's better for that. And I'm like, yeah, but the only content I care about <laughs> is the content that's, uh, you know, Dra Bram Stoker inspired. Uh, in in this case, uh, Bram Stoker, Mary Shelley, uh, Isaac Asimov to a dis to a degree, um, and basically, I uh, it, it, like um, the the idea for Iron Frontier kind of evolved off of a very simple thing. We saw um, I saw this image online of uh, like a character skin for League of Legends. I think it was. And, um, yeah, no, I, I just, the aesthetic was so strong and this kind of, it was like this kind of gothic cowboy kind of looking thing. And I was like, you know what? There's not enough of this in D&D. How do I make this in D&D? And the Iron Frontier really evolved very fast from that point because it became, well, okay, so we've got our, our basic themes. What do we, what, what makes this world unique? And having done a lot of kind of creation stuff before um i had a backlog of notes that i never used for anything that were all coming into play and i was like oh this should be fun um and yeah that's that's kind of how i am frontier started because uh, i just like D, D as a base system the kind of the d20 system in general is a really good system for you know um conflict in stories it's good at telling stories of conflict and so i tried to create a world where there was enough conflict that there was always something going on and there was always something for the player to be interested in mm -hmm. now you do make an interesting point you do make, make an interesting point with there not being enough um steampunk and when whenever i whenever um Whenever I'd see this point raised in forums or the like, I'd see somebody cry out about, say, um, Eb say Eberron. Except Eberron is not steampunk, um, and a lot. And I th and maybe you've had a similar experience, but a lot of people's idea of steampunk seems to begin and end with add more add more gears and valves that don't have a, that don't have much of a purpose. Um. Whereas it sounds like the approach that you want to take with steampunk is more getting getting down and dirty into industrial revolution er era um, societies. Uh, yeah, one of the um, one of the core kind of aspects of the Iron Frontier uh, is uh, the division between life on the frontier and life in the city. Mm -hmm. um, because life in the city is effectively just ruled by uh, a very distinct upper class called which are made up of organizations uh, and it it's in it's very inspired by that kind of uh, revolutionary level of thinking um because the world um is very corporatist um it's not it's not even a, like a capitalist world it's a corporatist world mm -hmm. Uh, that's run by a bankocracy like the bank rules everything because the bank has all the resources used by the organizations to make stuff to sell to the people that they actually need to function <laughs> so this sort of th this kind of dystopian world uh world view a really good uh like basis for uh kind of creating a more um intrigue level uh like conflict within uh D, &D. um it kind of it, it, i designed it with the sole intent of kind of enforcing that level of like investigation mm -hmm. and you know what what is going on in the you know there's all these dirty dealings going on in the organizations they have their own private military forces that enforce their rules and it's like oh well what is the bank up to what do the bank want like um, and that sort of thing is really fun for a lot of players, including myself. Um, so I try to kind of inject that in there and, um, it, it just then becomes very easy to tell stories that are quite, you know, uh, like revolutionary 
in both a kind of industrial sense and in like a in a socio political sense. Yeah. Um, now, admit admittedly, the the now I'm this might be this might be a bit, for lack of a better term, American of me to look at this, but I. I do look at a lot of um, the motifs with the iron fr with the iron frontier, and I um, I can't help I can't help but visualize the way the um, American West was during the during the first big oil booms, especially when um, when there was the aggressive expansion by Standard Oil Company. Mm -hmm. um, especially with that with that divide between a near plutocracy in more civilized areas and the a uh, more um, pioneering spirit, but that uh, that um that does bring me to one qu to um to one que to one question because um when it comes to integrating the old west into um, fantasy was that just was that just because it was um that a product of um games that you had played previously or was that a was that a case of this is unexplored territory cuz like when i first discovered iron frontier i ended up inadvertently making wild arms jokes in my head <laughs> um yeah i feel like um it's an area that isn't overly explored at least in a kind of commercial sense mm -hmm. um as you mentioned earlier, like the closest thing that you get to kind of steampunk uh, stories is uh, in D and D that are kind of backed by the publisher are the stories that you can make from Eberron. Um, and Eberron had this kind of very kind of depressing, like eternal war happening um, in its kind of early iterations in third edition. Mm -hmm. Uh, which has now evolved into, you know, the the what do you do after the uh, when the eternal war is finished? You know, <laughs> this entire race of beings made for this war that is no longer happening, and th those stories are really interesting. But the thing that I've always found is that the sort of technology level that people kind of go for in steampunk settings, uh, like when they're homebrewed or or anything like that, you always end up with that kind of token um, kind of frontier character, like those kind of Old West, like grizzled Clint Eastwood types. Mm -hmm. And it was just such a strong aesthetic and such a strong, um, like, theme that it felt like a shame that it wasn't really explored further elsewhere. And so when we were kind of breaking down what what is the iron frontier one of the many things that i kept uh coming back to was the idea that the world like the the old kind of frontier adage of like the world is your oyster you just have to go take it you know the, there's the the idea that then there's gold in then their hills yeah and that sort of thing of striking out on your own and making something of yourself and kind of having this sort of uh kind of self-driven narrative is a very strong theme in D, &D generally um in, at least in all the games that i've played you know like all the dms that i've either had or when i gm i like the players to just decide what they're doing i'll give them the information of what, what's going on they can then decide what it is they want to do and it gave such a good strong theme and such a strong way to kind of tie it together um that you know it, it wasn't so much that the that it wasn't explored that's just a happy byproduct i think um because it's just a very strong uh kind of thematic to to use to kind of tell those sorts of stories now when now um get given given the given the setup that you have narratively was it a, was when you were design when you were designing the setting did you design 
did you have the mindset of designing an entire region or did you have the mindset of design the city then design the surrounding areas and then go from there it was um it was a little bit of both um the book focuses uh, kind of primarily on frontier life as a general kind of thing that's happening mm -hmm. you know you've got your little frontier towns you've got the threats that exist there the kind of wilderness the bandits and all that stuff um which was an avenue for us for me to kind of outline those kind of self-driven stories like this is the playground within which you do that bit right mm -hmm. um and the, the cities kind of happened organically as i was kind of developing uh originally they were just going to be like bigger settlements before i decided that um they're they're proper you know industrial mega cities because it's such a weird um and kind of un a kind of untapped part like environment to tell stories in D D. Um again in like older editions of D D there was um places like um God, this is where I completely forget what it was called. Portal, I think was the name of it. Uh it was the the infinite city, uh which Sigil. Sigil, that's the one. Um, yes, no, Sigil was uh, the idea of this kind of infinitely sprawling city um, kind of played into the idea that I had for, like, this massive kind of self-contained, uh, like, location, which was so separate to everything that was going on outside. And that, that in a kind of way, like... Um, in Attack on Titan, for example, you have the kind of city that they live in and the different rings of the cities. And that's so far removed. The life of the people that live there is so far removed from, like, the Recon Corps who are going out there trying to find stuff. You know, those dangers that exist out in the wilderness just aren't a problem for people in the city. But that, but I, cre <laughs> I wanted to create a... Um, a, a location or a series of locations that though you're not at threat by monsters in quite the same way there are other threats and that's uh where the kind of uh kind of industrialist um like corporatist kind of society was built from mm -hmm. uh because it creates a, a much more kind of uh it creates a different kind of storytelling environment to the outside uh you know where on the outside you might tell stories of oh god the mist is coming and it brings with it the dead because they have nowhere to go anymore uh everybody hide and try not to die mm -hmm. the cities are so well removed from that they're protected from that but instead you have these weird things of hey one of the rich people has gone missing and has just been replaced with someone else because he said something about one of the organizations and it tells completely different tonal stories within the same setting and there are ways that i've written in for those like to cross over so that you know um so that people can tell stories that kind of are self that, that can be self-driven but they are kind of informed by what's happening in the world mm -hmm. uh so yeah, uh, sorry, I rambled for a little bit there, <laughs> but yeah, it, it's um, it is a. I think that the Western kind of theme plays so well into that, mm -hmm. personally, at least. And just out of, just out of curi just out of curiosity, I know you I know you had mentioned having a having a, a variety of experiences when it came to when it came to fi when it came to fiction literature. Um, but how much experience do you, how much experience did you have with um wet with westerns up before this uh limited i will say uh, like i but growing up i was actually kind of a kind of a bit of a fan of uh of those sorts of old western movies the Clint Eastwood movies like mm -hmm. the good the bad and the ugly you know your your classic kind of western the fare. trilogy and 
Yes. Oh, just fantastic. And like, I always really enjoyed it growing up because the the stories were relatively simple, but like the way that they in, the way that they translated tone to the audience was was so it was so strong it was so um it was unlike other kind of film genres it like you wouldn't have this kind of tense music in the background you'd have these tense silences which for movies but from that era was not particularly common at all um so yeah i was a little bit of a fan of that sort of thing but it was only after i started uh working on iron frontier and started kind of looking into the actual history which is far less glamorous um you know of uh but like the idea of the you know frontier life was sold as this kind of like this big gamble but it was the gamble you wanted to take uh and it was sold to you in such a such a such an aggressively direct way mm. uh and so like I wanted to, so that that kind of um, research kind of informed a lot of the decisions of how the like of how the world functions and how the organization gets people to like go out and start frontier towns and stuff like that. So mm-hmm. I now, think I'm a lot more versed in it now. Yeah. <laughs> um, now I would like to ask a few things um, mechan- mechanically, and I'll start with the. Um, organization affiliation rules, which um, the way the way it dis- the way um, that wording impl- um, carries an implication, at least to me, is that alignment is not as important as much as as much as who at, as much as what organization likes or hates you. Is that accurate? Um, I've always found uh, personally that. Alignment is a product of its time. Uh, it, it it can be very limiting, and I feel like if you're going to have a mechanic that's kind of tying people to a certain like social standing within a setting, that 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 should have implications in gameplay. Uh, so the affiliation rules are very kind. They're they're kind of a little bit like that, as you've said. They uh, functionally, it's just that. Uh, all the organizations love it when you do favors for them. <laughs> so, you know, uh, they will, like, if you end up as a mercenary who kind of gets contracted by one organization a lot, they'll give you discounts on their guns and, you know, things like prosthetics in case you lose an arm on a job, which is very much a thing that happens in the frontier. Um, so, because those things are kind of... Uh, organization based it made sense to kind of have a a rule setting for like how how do you create these sorts of um relationships with with these businesses um and yeah the uh the the byproduct of that is the organizations don't like each other (laughs) so the more affiliated you get with one organization the less the rest of them are gonna like you and that in turn carries its own like dangers like if you're if you're a mercenary who goes out onto the frontier and you help the azure iron company for example um you know if if you're well affiliated with them they hire you for these jobs a lot they pay you good money they give you massive discounts you know if you find a guild you may find that the gilded rose uh trading company may very well want to take you out because you're benefiting their rivals um so it kind of creates this um organic uh level of like relationship and trying to balance those relationships where possible again you could you could not do that and just take them on every time they come at you but um that's it's the sort of thing where it's it's there as an additional thing for the for the gm to be like okay so how do these people feel about you without having to spend a lot of time and effort kind of trying to come up with uh, that system by themselves? Because I know that's a problem that I've had before. Mm-hmm. Now, next, I wanted to ask on the custom lineage thing. Um, 
I've seen the, I've seen this kind of thing before, and and in some ta in some cases it ends up um, taking the form of some sort of life path system. Is that the approach that you're going with with this, or are or um, are you going with something a little bit a little bit more grandiose? Uh, so I think you're referring to the origins system, uh, which yeah. is basically yeah, it's a system that I've devised uh, that is. Basically, I don't like races in D and D. I think it's uh, I think it can be great when telling certain types of stories. Like if you're telling a traditional fantasy fair, you know, having codified like elves and orcs and that sort of thing is very much par for the course for that sort of uh, like uh, liter literary language. Um, however, it comes with its own flaws. Um, which are things that have been spoken about at length um, by the community and by developers alike. Um, and basically, I didn't, I think that I thought in the Iron Frontier, like the world has moved past this kind of golden age of man and monsters. Like the gods are no longer here. There's no one keeping the kind of like status quo, as it were. So they're just move past that and the origin system is literally just uh a replacement for races it's it's so that you can create your own custom lineage your own you know my great 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 grandfather was a was a moon elf and my great 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 grandmother was like a tiefling it doesn't matter ultimately it, it gives you it gives the player creative control over n not just the kind of mechanical elements of the the kind of race bonuses things like dark vision uh which are everywhere um but it also gives them that kind of aesthetic choice uh because i've if as i've said before on on my podcast um every every like player group has one and again i'm being hyperbolic but every group that i've ever been in has had one kind of numbers player somebody who really enjoys just making characters that roll high numbers at something and the thing is that for those people i always i will i'm always greeted with them with hey can you homebrew this for me because like i want to play this kind of character but i want to play this race and it doesn't work mechanically and basically the origin system is basically get rid of that like mm -hmm. you have a certain amount of points to spend on traits that you have inherited from your from your lineage and that is it like race is no longer a thing like don't need to worry about that don't need to worry about you know, do, are drow evil in this setting? Are orcs evil? It's like, no, we're, we're past that. People are people. And it's it's to kind of take control of the stories that you're trying to tell. And, uh, like, as a player, from the very, very start of character creation. All right. And that, br that brings me to um, Firearms. Now, obviously, we can't we can't do the old west without without have without having a few six shooters. That that was that's going to be inevitable. But um, so there's a couple of things that I'm cur that I'm curious about. You when we talked about the organizations thing, you had hinted that um, different organizations were going to have their own different models of um, equipment, and. The first question I wanted to ask is: Would would it be would it be an, would it be enough variance where, say, a pistol from two different organizations won't necessarily have the same baseline uh, stats? Um. <clears throat> so, in terms of that, I I've tried to keep it as simple as possible uh, because there was an iteration of firearm rules where there were like. 50 or 60 different types of base weapon and that quickly became very complicated and very kind of you know realistically how often are these things going to be used and so i did decide to like cut it down and basic firearms unmodified firearms only come in three variations pistols rifles and shotguns um 
they all have different max ammo limits uh they all have different damage they all have different ranges uh they have different properties mm -hmm. the thing that where the organizations come in is the organizations like to upgrade things so they have um specialities that they have for uh like uh for adapting weaponry so for example um rifles and shotguns have the loading rule when you've run out of ammo which is in two shots for a rifle or one shot for a shotgun uh you have to you're only allowed to shoot that one time because you have to spend the rest of it the rest of that action reloading your weapon mm -hmm. if you if you get your gun uh modified with it as your iron company uh you can remove that property for an amount of gold so uh it's a rap it's called a rapid fire unit for now um mm -hmm. <laughs> again like i'm trying to keep things nice and simple uh and so they're each kind of company uh, has their own specialties. There are, again, there are like some basic things that they all kind of do, basic upgrades like increasing your magazine size and stuff like that. But there will be, uh, there, there are kind of uh, things that only one company does like the rapid fire unit is something that only the azio iron company do does um the gilded the gilded rose trading company has a special kind of scope which massively increases your range um and it's only something that it's it's something that only they do mm -hmm. and the thing with the with the thing that makes this uh more interactive than just kind of going oh well i'm gonna go to this shop and then this shop and then this shop if the if a company if an organization sees that you have had your gun modded by another company they won't touch it like it is that level of disdain for one another which is where a lot of the uh supplementary rules come in because there is a an archite crafting feat that you can take uh it is basically illegal to be able to manufacture and create things with archite without being affiliated to a company but you you can choose to do that anyway and then you can kind of make these more specialist things yourself um you know spending time time in game and like gathering resources to to do that with um but yeah basically firearm started off very very complicated and uh i've i've tried to cut it down to its kind of bare bones like because adding too much to it just kind of detracts from the point it's trying to make. Yeah. Uh, and also, ultimately, people are just going to be like, I want two guns, give me two guns. <laughs> it's just like, okay, here, have two guns. Uh, I'm not going to make you pick between like 60 different guns. You want two pistols? Here's two pistols. And when it comes to when it comes to the re the uh, relationship with pist with um pistols and just firearms as as a whole um have you taken steps to ensure that they that they don't outshine people who are probably going to be um focusing on melee uh it is something that i have aggressively been considering for quite some time and basically i have made sure that uh the guns don't horrendously outshine other weapons of their type but there's still uh with the kind of modding things that you can do you can make a gun better than anything else if you really want to um and that comes down to player choice you know it's the same as mm -hmm. uh as kind of if you were to enchant a weapon you know do you do you pick up the flaming longsword or do you keep your do you keep your kind of unmagic longsword so that you can kind of customize it and do what you want with it? And uh, the the rules that I've developed have made it so that firearms are completely separate from like the enchanting stuff, uh, just to make things a bit more balanced and fair for those people who still want to do those kind of classic fantasy things. All right, and pl plus some. Eventually, someone's going to run out of bullets. 
that is true. Summer will eventually run out of bullets, and bullets are uh, inherently quite expensive. So, uh, yeah, the, the, there's a few things that I've taken into account while when developing firearms for that reason. Um, how, like, if we get funded, um, when the uh, when the playtest packet is sent through to everybody, I will be looking very. I'll be looking very directly at the feedback about firearms because I want them to feel good for the setting, but I don't want people to be unhappy with them being too powerful or too weak. So now, when it comes to subclasses, you've you've talked about how there's a new steampunk, western, or gothic subclass for every base class. Although something I do want to kind of call back to, you mentioned earlier that the go that um the gods and the pantheons aren't really as much of a factor as they might be in other settings or even in the past in this setting so i'm curious if um if people playing divine classes like say a cleric or a paladin is something that's going to be um on the table or if that's something that you would discourage so again, this is something that uh, took some serious uh, conversations between uh, me and the people who have to listen to me talk about my project. Um, unfortunately, my friends have heard way too much about this project at this point. But one of the things that I was very adamant about is the gods dead. The gods are gone. There's nothing. The, the gods were overthrown by man um, in the history of the Iron, of like the world. Mm -hmm. Um and the the higher and lower planes completely sealed off uh that's why a lot of the things that are happening in the world are happening like the the mist that carries the the spirits of the dead it's because they have nowhere else to go you know um so it was very difficult to kind of sit there and be like well i still want people to be able to play paladins and clerics and druids if they want to but i decided um that I was going to kind of take some time to research kind of old descriptions and like uh, some stories about these sorts of kind of eight archetypical characters. And one of the things that I've always, uh, that I found was kind of pervasive throughout the stories told about characters who would be traditionally defined as divine classes is that their power, though it does come from a higher power, is self-driven is it's a power that comes from within them um and so that's where we stand in iron frontier is that divine magic technically not a thing it's you know it's all arcane magic it's just different ways of accessing that arcane magic um and when you are a, a traditional kind of divine caster you access magic by your conviction your your belief in either a concept or your belief in yourself uh, is what kind of create formulates that magic. Uh, so yes, they are still playable. Yes, they still make sense in the setting. If you want to play one, go for it. One of the one of the subclasses I'm most excited about people playing is the paladin that walks around with a shotgun. Like it's gonna be great fun. And speaking of that. Now, now you gave a couple examples with the de with um with teasing the desperado fighter or the way of the bullet dancer that made me think that made me think of equilibrium for some reason, um, mm -hmm. but what can what can, but give me a few examples about what some of these subclasses would be able to do. In in a in a very basic rundown, uh, for example, we have uh the. The College of Wanderlust Bard. Uh, so it's a bard who uh, think uh, your traditional guitar strapped on his back, like charismatic cowboy type, you know, mm -hmm. like that very, very Clint Eastwood, like even like early Elvis Presley movies. Like, would El, <laughs> that would, um, El Mariachi of... count? Yes, that sort of thing. Um, and basically they have... Um, they have an ability uh, which is kind of the driving force of their class uh, is uh, multitasking. It's their ability to be able to do multiple uh, checks 
within a single round. Um, because vanilla D and D five E, um, you know, if you're spending your bonus action, you know, doing a survival check to see if you know anything about the enemy that you're facing or the terrain that you're in. Basically, their whole thing is that they know everything because they've been everywhere and they've seen it all. Mm -hmm. And so they're able to kind of access that sort of, um, those sorts of skills more reflexively. Um, so they can do multiple sorts of checks. They can be like, I don't know what that monster is. Have I heard of that thing? Let me do an arcana of religion and, uh, and, a, and a nature check to just uh, double check that, <laughs> that that's nothing that's going to kill me. Um, but they also have like uh, <clears throat> they also have uh, bonuses to persuasion and intimidation uh, based on the the music that they're playing as a kind of uh, Western backtrack, you know, um, your traditional kind of Western fanfare. They're kind of just sitting there playing it to kind of accent their point. Uh, and they have an ability to use lassos. So, uh, you know, um, it's similar to the kind of traditional net weapon except uh it just uses 50 feet of rope and you can just lasso people and you know drag them along behind you if you want um whereas you have something like the the circle of iron druid which is uh i think one of the other ones that we've teased so far uh the circle of iron druid is a druid who has connection not to like the land but to uh the mineral components within metal mm -hmm. um so they can wear metal armor unlike other traditional druids uh but they can also don and doff it as an action to turn it into uh, an animal companion so they can go you know what i'm wearing plate mail we're gonna ride somewhere and i need a horse they click their fingers, like, their magic pulls the armor off of their body, turns it into a horse, and they can ride that horse. Uh, or they can turn their scale mail into, like, a a tiger or something, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Maybe something a bit more, like a coyote, like, something that's a bit more setting appropriate, but, like, just as an example. Uh, and then they can use that as they would an animal companion to, like, in combat. Um... And then they can like pull the armor back onto them uh, when they when they need it, uh, and that's kind of what their kind of big gimmick. Uh, and yeah, the uh, you've also got things like the uh, the mist warlock. Uh, so a warlock whose patron is either the mist, which is a concept uh, the 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 concept of the dead have nowhere to go, so they exist within this literal mist that happens sometimes. Um, so it, their patron is either the mist itself or the mysterious beings that still remember who they are within the mist, including the monarch of the dead. Um, and they have the ability to uh, like turn incorporeal create areas of the mist through from which people can like take damage and they have limited vision um and uh they can make themselves kind of immune to the effects of the mist by going into that kind of ghostly form mm -hmm. uh so yeah they're, like every class has been kind of uh, objectively planned out to like a massive degree again I'll be looking to uh, see the feedback from people because uh, there may be certain themes that are not that need to be accented more, or you know I may have gone over the top and made made one of them <laughs> like numbers wise just a bit too good. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll be looking at that kind of feedback uh, very closely. Now, you already mentioned that one potential use of feats is. Um is illegal is illegal firearm crafting but what would be a few other examples of potential feats that are going to be that are going to be in the book to to further customize characters um feats is uh one of the things that has been kind of the most difficult to deal with uh we didn't want to make it so that everything that 
certain class subtypes could do was obtainable through a feat, which is the kind of the big thing going on in, in 5e at the moment. Um, like, for example, you can take a feat to get sorcery points, and you can take a feat to, like, get warlock invocations and things like that. And basically, I, I still wanted to keep the classes as their own, like, functionally, I wanted them to, to feel unique. However, there were cross points where it made more sense to have certain things as a feat. For example, the ability to dual wield pistols. <laughs> um, you know, the uh, the idea that um, you can, like, firing from horseback, which is a ridiculously difficult thing to do, um, you know, and it's these sorts of um, very Western... Uh, kind of tropes that I wanted to kind of rein in there. Mm -hmm. um, but also there are things like um, <clears throat> you can take feats to gain uh, to like have learned knowledge of certain things about the world which would come in very handy. It makes you better at dealing with the mist or the gilded or um, you know uh, things like that, uh, some of the other monsters that exist. Um, and uh, a couple of them will be... One of the uh, feats that I've gotten the the most feedback about <laughs> is um, the is a feat that... Um, it allows you to basically gain uh, extra points from the origin system to be able to be... Like, to have, like, a latent ancestral like genetic ability mm. come into fruition when you need it um so for example if you make a character without dark vision and then you're in a cave panicking because a monster you can't see is killing your friends you know you take the feat to do that and you know somewhere in your ancestry and your heritage one of your ancestors had dark vision and that kind of that kind of the feat allows you to then take those points in you know you have dark vision now so go help your friends oh my god they're all dying yeah and le um next i did want to ask on um, prosthetics now when it comes to prosthetics are you tr are are you treating them just as a new form, just a new um, pillar when it comes to equipment, or are there going to be some special rules in place when it comes to prosthetics? There are specific rules in place for prosthetics. Um, there are two types of prosthetics in uh, the Iron Frontier setting. Uh, there are your basic prosthetics, which are kind of more real world based. Um, you know, you can get like a like a blade leg or um you can get like a <clears throat> like a wooden arm or something mm -hmm. um and these mitigate a little bit the the penalties that you gain for having uh taken that severe wound um because it's all tied to the severe wound system uh so for example you can get a, a glass eye it doesn't restore your vision but you know, um, it does. Uh, it does kind of mitigate some of the some of the penalties that you gain from having a missing eye. Then you have archite prosthetics, which is kind of where the idea of having prosthetics came from. Is this uh, the the setting has this uh, very uh, <clears throat> this very distinct kind of propertyed material called archite which mm -hmm. basically is the reason technology works at all um there's lots of reasons behind that but that's that's a thing that will become apparent in the setting um when you have a prosthetic made of archite it replaces the limb it just fully functions as the limb would it connects to your nerves it just works um you know think full metal alchemist edward's uh arm and leg mm -hmm. yeah it just works now you know um 
it like you replace like if you get an arc by eye it will restore your vision back to how it was um and obviously the 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 thing that i get asked a lot is why wouldn't you just have an archite like prosthetic surely like it it, re it replaces it like kind of mitigates the disability entirely um and that's where the corruption mechanic comes in mm -hmm. because uh archite's not really good for you <laughs> um in fact the more archite you have uh on your person uh, the more likely you are to go insane and become a raving monster and basically transform into a, a gilded, which is a horrid monster with these kind of metal, uh, these kind of archite metal uh, appendages and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the thing with prosthetics is we've got a couple of frameworks for them at the moment because the other thing that i'm very very cautious of is i don't want to offend anybody um obviously not i like there is uh, a creator that i very much admire um who created the combat wheelchair and that was well she got far too much flack for making something so cool um but basically, because I don't have a, a physical disability, it is it is very difficult for me to kind of create a system that doesn't, you know, create inherent negatives to having lost limbs and things like that. And so I have a few frameworks that I would love to get. And I'm, I'm getting some of my friends um, and uh, hopefully we'll hear back from... Uh, the playtest, um, and basically, I just want to see. I, I want to make sure that I'm not offending anybody, but I'm also providing something that is new and exciting into the game that adds kind of a level of not realism, but realism for in that say in, in that sense. That's the one, yeah. Um, and on on that note, how um. What do you see? What do you see as far as the base page count for the book? Are you thinking uh, like two hundred pages? Yeah, look, when I've um, kind of planned out the book and how many pages everything is going to take, it's just over two hundred pages. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, depending on um, the feedback and uh, like editing as well, because honestly, I go on for way too long. So obviously with editing and taken into account it will be definitely in excess of 150 pages but based on my count it should be just around 200 if not a little bit more uh, and i'm get um guess i'm guessing the thing will be fully um indexed and bookmarked which, oh yes definitely it's gonna be the hardest reason, part of my job <laughs> the sole reason i bring up that kind of thing is it is a bit of a pet peeve of mine when um when bo when books aren't pr aren't um given proper navigation tools mm, that's fully understandable and it is is definitely going to be the hardest part of my job um is going to be making sure that all of the indexing is and contents and stuff mm -hmm. is done properly so that it's easy to navigate yeah. uh but yeah they, it will there are pages set out for the index so it will be there i promise you mm -hmm. Um, given given what you mentioned about the or about the organization um, setup, um, and I will I will admit this is one of the this is one of those long ball kind of things. But has there has there been consideration of doing a more Iron Frontier um, optimized character sheet? Yes, uh, it is something that um, somebody I've worked with previous uh, on another game that I made. Um, as the word uh, one of the things when I was developing that game uh, which I will be coming back to at some point in the future um, was that character sheets are very hard to design <laughs> um, and 
and optimize because you have to think about what information is is necessary uh mm -hmm. fortunately the person that worked on that character sheet that i did for that and i i not only did i make a character sheet for the for the player characters i also did a gm sheet which was, was uh a, a format through which uh gms could kind of write down their entire session and like have all of the information available on two pages uh because if they're anything like me it's like 15 notebooks with too many too many pages of nonsense that never comes up um so yeah one of, fortunately i'm still working with that person that they're, they're working as my community manager um mm -hmm. adler uh you, they they are brilliant at that sort of kind of uh, graphic design element so it will have if not optimized very aesthetically pleasing <laughs> thematic uh uh character sheet for the setting yeah yeah the main reason i asked that kind of thing is because i could i um i could see that i could see that kind of thing being ideally implemented when it comes to or when it comes to both organizations and when it comes to the whole um corruption thing mm, yes uh as corruption is effectively a new stat, that is definitely something that I've taken into consideration. Um, especially because you also have, as you said, the affiliations for each organization. Um, and that all takes up space on the sheet. So uh, that, yeah, it, there, there will be a new sheet in the book. Um, it will be as optimized as is humanly possible uh, but it will also be very aesthetically pleasing. So. All right. Um, and with with all of that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the insanity at play here. Thank you very much for having me. Honestly, it's it's been nice. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say, drinking is not mandatory. But it is encouraged. <laughs> yes, uh, I will definitely be in contact again. This, this has been good. I've, I've enjoyed this. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, Stay fucking frosty, everybody.